Welcome to What's the Deal, our investment banking podcast on Making Sense, the hub for JP Morgan corporate and investment bank podcasts. In each episode of What's the Deal, we'll explore the trends that are driving deal making and transforming industries today. Hello, and welcome to What's the Deal. I'm your host today, Kathleen Darling from JP Morgan's Debt Capital Markets team. I'm excited to be joined by Todd Rothman, Managing Director of our North American High Yield and Leverage Loan Capital Markets team, to discuss the 2023 activity being seen across M&A and leverage buyouts. Todd, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Kathleen. Great to be here. Really appreciate you having me. It would be great if you could share with our listeners your background at JP Morgan, both in the U.S. and abroad. Sure. So I'm a lifer at JP Morgan. This July will mark 24 years. Started my career in our global syndicated finance business in New York. Ultimately moved to London in 2010 for what was supposed to be two or three years. Ended up staying 11 and a half years. Came back to New York about two years ago now. I started my leverage finance career on the origination side. I moved to the capital markets desk about seven years ago. Earlier in my career as an associate, I actually spent a year in our natural resources IB coverage team where I focused more on equity and M&A. So those are areas that are near and dear to my heart as well. That's great. Turning to this, the M&A pipeline was quite dismal in the back half of 2022 and through the first quarter of 2023, as we saw uncertainties from geopolitical events, central bank rate policies, U.S. regional banking turmoil, and just an overall economic slowdown, which really put an element of uncertainty into markets. As some of these factors begin to abate, can you talk about the activity you are seeing in the leveraged finance capital markets for both M&A and leveraged buyouts? Sure. So I think before we dive into what the world feels like today, it's helpful to take a quick step back into what the world looked like in 2021 pre-Russia-Ukraine. So if we go back to the 2021 period, that's when we hit a post-financial crisis peak with $105 billion of underwritten loans and bonds in the U.S. market, $141 billion globally. Now, if we roll the clock forward to today, Those numbers are roughly $43 billion for the U.S., $52 billion globally. And if you strip out some of the more corporate-style 364-day bridges in there, the amount of paper that's actually going to come to the institutional debt markets is a lot lower than that. So comparing that to the amount of cash that's sitting on the sidelines, it's really a blip on the radar that isn't going to make a dent. The good news for companies who raise capital today for M&A, whether it's LBOs or on the corporate side, is that we are continuing to underwrite new transactions in the modern world that we're living in, whether it was the regional banking crisis earlier this year or any of the other macro events that have taken place. I think the big difference that we've seen in 2023 versus what the world looked like pre-Russia, Ukraine, is really the structure of what those deals look like. So the LBOs that we've seen so far in 2023 Common themes have been equity checks that have been north of 40%, credit profiles that are more defensive in nature, that the buy side can take a view, will be a lot more recession resilient, depending on what your view is on a potential recession later this year or next year. Lower leverage versus what a credit really could support versus where some individual credits had been rated historically. And then ratings are the other factor. Whereas in the past, we would do a lot of LBOs with B3 ratings. Today, it's really been strong single B or worst case, mid single B that we're solving for. Todd, thanks for covering the landscape over the past two years. Maybe can we talk a little about what's next for 2023? So in terms of what we're looking for to see momentum change in the way of M&A financing and LBO financing activity, I think there's really two things that management teams, boardrooms, and the buy side are really looking for. One of those is a better feel for the form and the timing of any type of recession, whether that's later in 2023 or in 2024. And the second thing is a clearer path on the actual horizon for when rates stop hiking when we actually see rates flatten out, and when people can genuinely believe that rates are going to start getting cut. Putting those two things together is really what we need to get more equilibrium between what buyer and seller valuation expectations are. That'll also lead to more robust financing activity that's possible to fund those larger transactions. On a previous episode with Brian Tramatozzi, we spoke about cash balances remaining strong, 
Do you expect more of these cash reserves to be deployed for M&A, or do you still think there's an underlying cautious tone from both investors and lenders? So similar to what I talked about in terms of underwriting activity, I think the buy side's operating under a similar set of parameters. So I think that the money is out there to fund new transactions. I think really what we're seeing is the buy side pick their spots for the credits that they like, the deals that they feel have been well-structured. So cash balances in the high-yield market remain quite strong, just under 4%. The loan market technical has gotten a little more challenging, but again, for the right deals, we've seen that market show up in good size as well. Part of what's driving that is what we've seen in terms of CLO issuance this year, which right now is down year over year, $54 billion this year. Last year, we were at $73 billion. When you combine that with the fact that you have a large portion of the CLO market that is continuing to roll past its reinvestment period, we are seeing the availability of dollars and euros shrink from where it has been previously. And that's part of why we really encourage investors and lenders to do two things from an issuer and borrower standpoint. One is for those that need to raise capital, the strong advice is to go take advantage of the money that's available out there now and refinance debt that's coming due, not just in 2023 and 24, but also in 2025 and 2026. Part of that as well, we often talk about new money transactions being new M&A financings, new LBO financings, but what we're seeing in a number of these term loan refinancings in particular is that not every existing lender is capable or willing to extend their maturities and roll into a new deal. And so some of the new money that is available on the sidelines today is being used as part of that refinancing activity. So I think the message is that the loan market will continue to be challenging for larger size in the near to medium term. For the right credits, the market is absolutely there for folks. And I think what this means as well is that also accessing the bond market, also considering to access the European market for credits that aren't just U.S., but more global in nature are going to continue to be more important. You opened up the podcast saying 2021 was a notable year for M&A and leveraged buyouts, with many of these transactions being funded majorly with debt. As rates have increased, resulting in more expensive capital, how are you seeing companies assess pro forma capitalization for these acquisitions? As I talked about before, in terms of what the prototypical LBO looks like in 2023, part of the way we're addressing that very problem is lower leverage. So a deal that might have been able to be levered at six, six and a half, seven times two, three years ago, today we're doing that deal a turn, two turns, three turns lower leverage, in part because of investor and lender caution, given the economic uncertainty, but also because interest rates are simply higher, companies can't support the same amount of debt that they were able to before. I touched on the loan market technical and how that part of the equation has been a bit more difficult this year. Part of the way we filled that void has been introducing secured bonds a lot more into the equation to help raise the amount of debt capital that companies are looking to put on the balance sheet. One thing we have not really tested yet, though, is the market for triple C unsecured LBO bonds. There have been a couple of successful refinancings of that ilk so far this year, but I think that's really going to be one of the key components to unlocking more LBO activity in terms of being able to get a little more leverage and be able to stretch a little bit more on valuation versus where the expectations are for people that are selling their company, whether they're publicly listed or held privately today. This year, we've seen very little in the way of junior capital, whether it's subordinated bonds, unsecured bonds, second lien loans that have come to market. In fact, only $5.1 billion of unsecured paper has been underwritten so far this year, which is about 18% of total volume. That's down substantially from where things stood pre-Russia-Ukraine. Great. And where exactly does private credit play in here? So we talked about secured bonds and also accessing the euro market as a way to find incremental capital to fund leverage buyouts and corporate M&A. Private credit has been another avenue that's been utilized. I'd say that's been a bit more prevalent in the middle market space. We have seen it in a couple of larger scale LBOs that have come to market. 
What's interesting, though, is as the market has improved over the course of 2023, we've actually seen financial sponsors see the merits of refinancing those private credit deals in the broadly syndicated loan market due to their lower costs, being more scalable in nature over the course of time, and ultimately more borrower-friendly terms. Going off the overall structuring that we're seeing for these deals, there's also the documentation element. Can you touch on the trends you're seeing there as well for deals getting done in 2023? What we've seen from both bond investors and lenders this year really has been an increased focus on how do I protect myself? We continue to be in an environment that has macro uncertainty, the risk of a recession coming, an expectation that default rates are going to continue to rise in both the loan market and the bond market. And what you're seeing is lenders and investors really dig more into the documentation and figure out what loopholes are there that could be used by a borrower or by an issuer that could potentially dilute the recoveries of a secured lender or bond investor today, whether that's moving assets to unrestricted subsidiaries, whether that's raising capital at non-guarantor entities. And so you've seen a lot of focus on the proverbial protections like for Chewy, J. Crew, Serta, and provisions. And that's really been the focus that we've seen from the buy side. Todd, this has been great. We touched on a lot from M&A, leverage buyouts, documentation, overall structuring, and the trends that we're seeing from 2021 versus today. I think it'll really give our listeners a lot to digest. It was an absolute pleasure having you today on What's the Deal? Kathleen, really appreciate you having me. Thanks for listening to What's the Deal? If you've enjoyed this conversation, we hope you'll review, rate, and subscribe to J.P. Morgan's Making Sense to stay on top of the latest industry news and trends. Available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and YouTube. To stay ahead of the curve, sign up for J.P. Morgan's In Context newsletter, packed full of market views and expert insights delivered straight to you. To subscribe, just visit jpmorgan.com forward slash in hyphen context. This material was prepared by the Investment Banking Group of J.P. Morgan Securities, LLC, and not the firm's research department. It is for informational purposes only and is not intended as an offer or solicitation for the purchase, sale, or tender of any financial instrument.